Welcome everybody to the first edition of our EBM expeditions. This is a series where we kind of dive into the various basics, advanced and expert topics that we have throughout the ecosystem of our beloved EVM. Today, uh, Merkle Plant is going to be diving into Soulmate, kind of explaining what is Soulmate, what makes it different to um, libraries like Open Zeppelin and why it might be useful to you, uh, but what to watch out for since it's not uh, super straightforward, especially when you're looking for things like documentation. But yeah, without further ado, uh, take it away. Okay, yeah, then uh, welcome. Uh, this is a small presentation or education session about uh, Soulmate that library um, probably all of us heard already about. Um, yeah, this is the repository. It's currently private. We can make it public afterwards and all the documentation and code and code comments are inside here. So um, we can use it as a reference later. Um, first of all, a little bit of history about Soulmate. Soulmate is written or was written by Transmission 11. Probably most of you know him from um, Twitter or also from Soulmate. Um, he's famous for or it's what I would say is famous for his low level gas optimizations and uh, data driven solidity engineering. So um, actually really testing which gas optimizations make sense and which is just um, making code more ugly. Um, initially, the Soulmate uh, project started inside of Rary Capital, where he was employed there. Um, after he moved to Paradigm as a research engineer, he also moved this uh, repo to his private repo. So nowadays, you can find it at trans transmissions 11 slash Soulmate. Um, because we are here at Byte-Rocket and we are kind of security focused and do a lot of auditing, um, there's, I want to put on a big disclaimer directly in the beginning about security in Soulmate. Um, this is copied directly from the README. Um, this contracts are not designed with user safety in mind. They are implicit invariants. This contracts expect to hold. Um, that's quite important. They are implicit invariants. They're not explicitly enforced and you can break them accidentally, what we are also going to do soon. Um, you can easily shoot yourself in the food if you're not careful. Um, careful is here kind of a hard um, thing to say because you actually have to be really careful and really understand a lot about the contracts. And you should truthfully read each contract you plan to use top to bottom, which is also kind of a hard requirement because a lot of the code is in assembly. And um, yeah, just today where I was um, on Twitter this morning, uh, I saw someone asking, hey, transmissions, is there some documentation for Soulmate and some other kind of famous optimizer um, answered, no, the code is designed to be self-documenting. So um, we're also going to see that in a second, there's really nearly no documentation. It's really clean code. It is as self-documenting as it can possibly be probably, but a lot of the stuff is anyway in assembly. And um, we, yeah, that's why we're going through this with some focus on security. Um, one, point about uh, auditing projects when you when we audit a project which will which uses soulmate as a dependency um well i would personally say we can assume that soulmate itself is secure um for example every major version gets audited and it's definitely used by a lot of uh known projects um we should anyway each contract that's used from soulmate we should study it carefully too because just because um we have functionality that is Named similar in Open Zeppelin, for example, the safe ERC20 transfer function. Uh, Open Zeppelin has this, Soulmate has this, there are different invariants that both of them have. While one is working on Open Zeppelin, you can shoot yourself in the foot with the Soulmate version. Um, so don't assume to understand Soulmate without having read all the code. Um, then a little bit of the philosophical differences to Open Zeppelin because Open Zeppelin is kind of the pendant with the standard library building block smart contracts. Um, Nicolas Venturo, he's uh, one of the, I think, founding members, or at least very early members from Open Zeppelin, recently said in a podcast, um, Open Zeppelin has as a goal to make it as hard as possible to misuse the contracts. It should, yeah, you should, it should be really hard as a programmer if you inherit any of the so Open Zeppelin contracts to shoot yourself in the foot. 
So it should be useful for every Solidity programmer, uh, also for beginners. Solmate has kind of is on the direct opposite of the spectrum. Solmate optimizes as much as possible for the average case. Average case means the case that this execution flow that's executed 99% of the time. And corner cases per definition are less than 1% of the time. If you optimize for the average case, it means you do not check for the corner cases. Um, and this is also where there are a lot of fruit guns in um, Soulmate. But for that, I mean, more than 99% of the time, these checks are unnecessary. And if you know exactly what you're doing, then you can save a lot of gas by um, not implementing these checks. Also, one other point is Soulmate is highly opinionated. There's not much to say about this. It's about opinions, but um, do not expect it to be as kind of neutral, objectively, um, like neutral evil, if you have this meme with neutral evil. Um, Soulmate is definitely on the extreme spectrum, while um, Open Zeppelin is, is on the neutral spectrum in the neutral corner. Um, one personal opinion about Soulmate uh, that I really like about this whole project is that uh, they do not try to reinvent the wheel with a lot of contracts that they're using, but instead um, Transmission 11 got inspired by a lot of different high quality battle proof projects. For example, Open Zeppelin, Uniswap, um, DS, the DevHub uh, system, which is MakerDAO's build on that. Uh, he copied code from a lot of different parts and that's really nice, I think. Um, so now to the important part, to the um, kind of what's interesting, um, what is actually provided? What kind of contracts do we have here? Um, SOMED provides um, some authentication mechanisms, um, an owned contract. It's kind of the same as the ownable um, authentication um, contract that we're also going to look into, um, and some kinds of words authority, um, some authority contracts. This words authority contract is similar to Open Zeppelin's access control. Um, it provides mix scenes, um, in this case, the ESC4626 uh, implementation. This is this new Vault implementation. Um, Transmission Lens was also a co-author for that. And if I remember correctly, this Soulmate implementation is also the reference implementation. So uh, definitely a good place to study if you're interested in this, uh, in this tokenized Vault. Um, it provides some tokens, a WE token, ESC20, 721, and 1155, of course, the standard NFTs and uh, ESC20 tokens, and a lot of utils, for example, an S-Store 2 contract, Create 3 contract. These are both really interesting. I would uh, uh, give you the tip to check into it because these are really interesting ideas, um, but we don't have the time for that today. We also have a Merkle proof uh, library, we and Transy Guard, and some safe transfer libraries. And uh, the libraries marked here with the arrow, this is what we're going to check into now. Um, first, to give you some feelings about the differences in documentation, um, we have here on the left Soulmate um, repository. And we're going to first check out the We and Transy Guard, because I think We and Transy is kind of the most simple contract that you can have and that you can find in both of this. Um, projects. So here on the left, we have the and Transy Guard from Soulmate. And here on the right, we have the and Transy Guard from uh, Open Zeppelin. Both of these contracts are exactly uh, equivalent in functionality. We have a modifier non reentrant We check if it's uh, if, if locked is equals to zero so that we did not enter this um, um, modifier already. We set the lock to two. We execute whatever kind of function this modifier is appended to, and then afterwards we remove the lock again. In Open Zeppelin, we do the exact same thing, just that we um, kind of abstracted these numbers one, two um, by some constants. And instead of setting the variables directly, we do some, um, some function calls in which we check everything. However, if you look at both of those contracts, you see probably one big difference in that Open Zeppelin provides a lot more documentation. For example, one question you maybe have if you check this contract for the first time is why do we not use zero one here? That's kind of the normal way to count as a programmer, right? Um, this has to do with some gas optimization. Open Zeppelin explains this really well. Open Zeppelin provides you with an EEP where um, some other gas refund uh, mechanism is linked to and 
SoulMed kind of expects you to know about this um, or otherwise links to Open Zeppelin directly. So um, yeah, I hope this meme up here that there's no documentation became a little bit obvious. And now we're going to check into the first real contract that's interesting into the authority contract. Um, we have this here. So what's authority? Authority itself provides a flexible, updatable auth pattern that is completely separate from application logic. Um, we see it's modified from Depsys. Depsys is uh, the system that uh, from the people from MakerDAO and uh, MakerDAO is built a lot on Depsys. So it's definitely of high quality and audited and battle proofed. And um, this should be closed. We're going to look into that in a second. And we see it's also not such a long contract. We have down here an interface definition, authority. Um, it, an authority instance has a function can call in which you can give a user a target, which contract to call and the function signature. So in the end, you can ask an authority instance, uh, can this user call this contract on this contract, this function signature? And it returns either, yes, the user is allowed to call this function on this contract, or the user is not allowed to do this. Um, so this is kind of our instance that we always ask for whether someone is allowed to call the function. Then um, during the construction of the contract, we, uh, we set an owner and we set one authority instance. So the guy that we are asking, hey, is this user allowed to call something? And um, emit, yeah, emit some events about this. Um, we have two borrowing functions, set authority and set owner, which are kind of just, yeah, you set a new owner, you set a new authority, nothing too interesting here. Um, and yeah, we see already the real important function is the is authorized function. We have a modifier requires auth, which in the end also just calls this is authorized function. So if we inherit from this auth contract and we want to uh, protect our functions, we append this requires auth func modifier to it. Uh, it in the end calls the is authorized function. And um, this is where we're going to check now what this exactly does. So. We asked the is authorized function, is this user allowed to call some specific function? And we see here that we asked the authority instance, is this user allowed to call inside of this contract, uh, this function? And um, if it's allowed to call this, then yeah, we return already directly to, yes, it's allowed. And if we have something that the authority says, no, this user is not allowed to call this protected function, then we check, okay, is, um, are we the owner of the contract? Because if we are the owner, then of course we are allowed to do whatever we want. We are allowed to do this um, and are not dependent on the authority. Um, and now we check out something in the original contract. So this is the original DevHub DS auth contract where this contract is copied or modified from. And here we also have this authorized function. We kind of have the same stuff. We check if we are the owner, then yes, you're allowed to. Um, and in the end, we also do this authority can call. We also do this, can we ask the authority whether the user is allowed to call this. And um, it's kind of similar, but there's one big difference that um, is quite important and that we're going to talk about now. So we see that this is an external call, right? We call some other contract. And with external calls, we always have the problem, they can revert, they can use all the gas that we have in our um, execution. So um, yeah, that's, that's the question. What if we um, have set our authority and we for some reason lost control over our authority? Uh, the authority got compromised, we maybe lost the owner that was, uh, uh, that was the owner of this authority and someone changes something in the contract and uh, makes it so that this call always reverts or uses all the gas possible and this way uh, ends our execution. Then our whole system is broken. We cannot, in this case, cannot, any, cannot call any protected functions anymore because even if we are the owner, uh, we first execute this function call and if this fails, then we ask uh, whether, we are, um, whether we are the current owner. So if this call always reverts, even if we are the owner, we are not able to change our authority anymore. And this is a new trust assumption to the authority that's um, 
definitely nowhere inside of Open Zeppelin and also not inside of the original DS auth contract. Um, it is documented that as soon as um, the authority is out of order, even the owner is not able to call protected functions anymore. Um, yeah, but it's not like you have to really read the code to understand this problem. And uh, one question is, of course, okay, how can we fix this? Um, that's kind of easy. We just have to change this um, change this call the other way around. So we have to first check whether the owner is the user. And if we are the owner already, uh, if we're not the owner, then we just ask the authority. Why does he not, why, why does SOMED not do this? Um, well, most of the time, the caller is not the owner. 99% of the time, the caller is someone who's, uh, who has to be asked to the authority whether he's allowed to call it or not. And um, as already mentioned, SOMED optimizes for the average case, not for the 1% case. So that's why um, we first do this dangerous call that could be word, and only in the 1% where actually the owner is calling, um, we do this check. Um, yeah, why is it implemented like this? Because it saves gas on the average case. So uh, you have to remember when you use SOMED, there's an assumption that's not documented here. It's not inside of the contract that it was modified from. And we are also not used to this kind of assumption from Open Zeppelin because they have a different trust, they enforce different trust models. Uh, SOMED assumes that the authority instance is never compromised or broken. Um, yeah, I hope this made it clear that you have to go into the code, read the code, read all the comments, and that there are quite a lot of foot guns um, possible. That's it about the auth contract. And um, now we're going to go into the ESC20 and ESC721 contracts, which, um, yeah, everyone probably kind of knows what they're doing. So, um, Let's first check out the ESC20 contract. It's a modern gas efficient ESC20 and EEP2612 implementation. 2612 is this permit functionality that you can sign signatures and without approving, someone can then spend the tokens. Um, it's modified from Uniswap. That's a good sign. Uniswap is definitely battle proofed. Um, we have here again um, some comment do not manually set balances without updating total supply as the sum of all user balances must not exceed it. Mm. This is kind of an invariant that we are used to with ESC20 tokens, right? That the sum of all balances uh, equals the total supply. That's, yeah, that's kind of given. It's not directly defined in the ESC20 contract, but it only makes sense. However, here it seems that um, we kind of have to be especially careful about it. And, um, yeah, let's close this comments here. We're going to come to that in a second. So um, we see again, if we just scroll through it, there's nearly no documentation, um, but really clean code. So that's nice. It's also not long. It's just 240 lines of code. Um, let's cross check this with the open Zeppelin implementation. We see again, Open Zeppelin seems to have a lot more documentation and also a lot more functions. Open Zeppelin does a lot of this uh, writing small functions before token transfer, after token transfer. Open Zepp, uh, Soulmate itself does not have this. Um, one, in one interesting difference in the variables that we have here is that in Open Zeppelin, all the variables that we need, like the balances, the allowances, all of them are private. Private means that even the downstream contract, so if we inherit from the ERC20, even then we cannot change access, uh, this balances, this variables directly. We cannot even read them. The only way we can change, we can mutate this balances array inside of Open Zeppelin is um, by either using the transfer function or by using the mint and associative burn functions. Otherwise, we cannot um, change the balances array. In ESC20, in Soulmates, uh, we see this kind of stuff is public. Public means, first of all, of course, that um, this function here is output generated. Um, this view function returns new int. Um, that's kind of convenient. 
but it also means that we, when we inherit from this contract, that we can directly access this balance of um, mapping and directly mutate it. And um, we're going to see how this will become a problem in a second um, by checking out the transfer function. So um, yeah, let's check out this transfer function. We have ERC20 transfer, we uh, have the address we want to send something to, the amount we want to send it to, and um, what's kind of catches the eye directly is that there's not a single check, right? We know that um, we are only allowed to send tokens if we actually have that amount of tokens. We're not allowed to send negative, like get into negative amount. Um, if we check this in, in Open Zeppelin, which directly calls this internal transfer function, which is here, we see um, here it has this require statement. We require that the balance that the from address has, the sender, is more than uh, the amount that he wants to send so that uh, we do not exceed our balance. Um, how does Soulmate does it? Um, if we check here, Soulmate is based on contracts more, uh, with an older version than 0 0.8. So uh, we have over underflow protection. So we see here that this check is actually there, but it's uh, implicitly inside of the code because um, like we do not check directly here with the require statement whether we have our um, whether we have enough tokens. We check it implicitly by knowing that if we would send more tokens than we have, we would create an underflow. And an underflow re reverts, of course. Um, so it's totally fine. It's as secure as Open Zeppelin, but. One difference is if we are now building a bigger system and we test it and we have our tests and especially this fuzzing test, we get weird outputs and suddenly um, we get some kind of a user sends more tokens than he has to. Um, in Open Zeppelin, we will get some nice message, ESC20 transfer amount exceeds balance. What do we get in Soulmate? In Soulmate, we get a dangerous over underflow occurred. We have no idea what exactly happened. It's a lot harder to debug our code than um, having uh, nice error messages. But of course, this string needs to be saved somewhere. It's saved in the bytecode of the contract. This require statement is um, some, in the end, branching that happens in the bytecode level. So this costs a lot more gas than uh, just doing this. And we see, again, it's made for experts and not so much for simple users. And um, then we afterwards, yeah, we subtracted the amount from the sender, and we need to increase that amount at the person we sent this uh, tokens to. And here's a comment, uh, unchecked. Unchecked means that there's no over underflow protection inside of um, this statement. And we have a nice comment that this cannot overflow because the sum of all user balances can't exceed the maximal, maximum U in 256 value. Um, why does it cannot do this? Um, because we have this correlation between all the balances and the total supply variable. And this total supply variable um, is a U in 256. So if we have this invariant that all the balances summed up is the total supply, and the total supply is a U in 256, we know that no balance, that the sum of all balances cannot be more than, a, than the U in 256. Otherwise, we would have an overflow inside of this variable already. Um, well, however, actually, the statement is not 100% true in this case. Um, this is only true if we keep this invariant that the total supply and the sum of our balances, if we, um, if we follow it, if we keep it. Um, however, technically, it's possible for us, for a downstream contract who inherits from this contract, to directly man manipulate this balance of area, right, um, without adjusting the total supply. Maybe to make this a little bit more clear, we can check the um, we can check here the mint function inside of Open Zeppelin, and also the mint function inside of uh, inside of Soulmate. So in both cases, we adjust the total supply, and if we would have now a total supply of more than U in two hundred fifty six, we would have an overflow, and both of these functions would fail, and um, then we adjust the balance off like we mint this token somewhere. And this we can do without overflow protection because we know already, like we had already the overflow protection in this part here. Um, and in Open Zeppelin, we know that this balances variable 
uh, that this is private, so we cannot access it. And the only way to check mint tokens in Open Zeppelin is by using the mint function. However, in Soulmate, we can use uh, we can directly access this. So I um, wrote a funny test in which we create more tokens than U in two hundred fifty six. Um, we have here our mock ESC twenty. It inherits from uh, this contract, and it's in the end just a wrapper around the mint and the burn function used for testing. And I created one funny function, uh, mint without adjusting total supply. So uh, we do not we mint new tokens, but we use not do not use soulmate's mint function. Uh, we do it ourselves by directly mutating this balance of mapping. We just mint to someone tokens. And this means that the total supply is not adjusted. And um, now we're going to check out the test. So we have here some test overflow and transfer. And um, this is the test that we are going to do now in which we create an overflow. Um, we mint type U and max tokens to beef, to zero X beef. And um, afterwards we assert that the total supply is now U and max, and also that the balance off from beef is U and max. This is kind of normal, right? We mint some tokens, we accept that the total, total supply increased and that this guy actually has now this token. And now we're doing, we're calling this function. We're adjusting the balance of mapping directly by um, calling it, yeah. And uh, we again mint type U and max tokens, this guy time to zero X coffee, to, to the coffee guy. And uh, if we now check again the total supply, it will still be type U and uh, max because in this function, we did not adjust the total supply, right? And um, if we check the balance of from coffee, where we just minted this token, he also has type U and max. So now we have in our system kind of a big problem because we have two different addresses which both hold type U and max tokens, where at the same time, the total supply still says type U and max too. And now we're going to see how this can also break something. So now we have, uh, this is a cheat code from Foundry. So we pretend now to be this zero X beef guy and we transfer all the tokens that we have to zero X cafe. Um, then of course, beef should have no tokens anymore because we send all of them to cafe and cafe should have some amount of tokens. Why this amount, we come to that in a second. So um, let's run this test. We uh, run ESC20 tests and we only want to run the, um, the overflow test. Uh, we add a lot of these. Ah, okay. Yay. Okay, Whew. works. So uh, what did we do? Um, we meant to the beef this big amount of tokens. Uh, the total supply is adjusted to this big amount of tokens and the beef guy actually also has this big amount of tokens. We mint again tokens, uh, this guy to coffee, this time to coffee, the same amount of tokens. The total supply did not adjust. And we now have here two times um, two people with balances of type U and max. And then we transfer all the tokens from um, the beef guy to the coffee guy. So we have in the end, the coffee guy now holds two times type U and max tokens. And um, we assert here that that is uh, type U and max minus one. Why is it type U and max minus one and not uh, like something else? Um, where we have one token, then we have this overflow and we are at zero again. And uh, then we have type U and max minus one left to increase the balance again. So uh, the zero X cafe guy now has type U and max minus one uh, tokens. And what happened here is that this part here, this code here overflowed. That's why um, the cafe guy has, that's why we did not fail. If we remove this check here, this unchecked uh, block, so this gas optimization, and run this stuff again, we will see, we finally get our arithmetic over underflow. And um, yeah, at least our system broke in a way that like it should break because uh, our invariant is broken. 
So um, if we see it, look at this from a bigger perspective, what's the, what's the overall problem here? So in ESC20, we have conventionally or logically this invariant that the sum of all balances equals the total supply. Um, however, this invariant is um, not directly enforced by this contract. Um, it expects, Soulmate expects its users, which means the developers, the program, um, to not break it themselves, but it does not enforce it. Uh, as you can see, you can shoot yourself in the food and create more than type U and max tokens. In Open Zeppelin, this is not possible. You can only mint tokens by using this function. And because this function both uh, adjusts total supply and the balances, this invariant is always given. Um, why does Soulmate use this? Well, first of all, over underflow protection costs gas. So we are again at some kind of gas optimization game. Um, <coughs> but other one other reason that um, we could think about is maybe it enables use cases that we don't think about yet. Like it enables possibilities for programmers to maybe adjust, you know, maybe to set this invariant out for a little bit and then uh, make it true later on again. And as a side note also, I checked the ESC20 standard again, and this invariant is not defined per standard. So it actually does not break the standard. It does not have to be. It's just kind of a logical invariant that most of the time should be there. Um, but there exists at least one other token, the Ample token, that also does not enforce this, um, this uh, constraint over the lifetime of um, the its ERC20 token. Um, yeah, that, that's it about the ESC20. And yeah. Uh, maybe a use case would be, for example, if, if a user wants to flash mint the, uh, um, the ESC20 tokens, but he exceeds the, uh, um, he, he basically says, I want a very huge amount of the token, but he would basically break the, the total supply. Um, be, because there's already some supply in um, in the uh, uh, ESC20 uh, contract, for yeah, just I, just as an example. I, I think that's true. I mean, I think most systems still don't want this uh, invariant to be broken, but I think there are definitely valid use cases. And this flash loan example sounds like one where it would definitely be possible. And um, yeah, so we can also remember with great power, you, can, you are able to do this. You're not able to do this with Open Zeppelin. Comes great responsibility. If you ever audit a system where you see that someone is accessing this soulmate variables directly, either, yeah, like get another cup of coffee. It will be a long time because you really have to check it then again. Um, and now we're going to get into the NFT ERC721 contract and we're kind of doing the same game again. We are. Um, Check cross checking it with uh, with the ESD uh, with the Open Zeppelin implementation and um, check some differences. Um, first of all, saying because here are some differences in how functions uh, work, but uh, both of them are totally ESC seven to one compatible. Um, we have again here the same uh, problem or possibility. Um, in Open Zeppelin, all the variables are private. The only way even you as a programmer can access these variables is by using the um, official functions like, uh, like this safe mint function and stuff. Um, this is again so that Open Zeppelin can ensure that some invariants are always given. In um, Soulmate, it's internal. That means you can, if you inherit from this contract, you can mutate them. So you are again free to do whatever you want. Um, we have we have the owner of uh, uh, function. Um, so NFTs in the end are just this IDs, right? And we ask here in the owner of function, okay, who's the owner of this ID? We check inside of this array, uh, the owner is some address, and uh, then we return this address. But the ERC721 standard is quite interesting, I think, because it expects this owner of function to be word in case the token does not exist yet. Um, so if you check who's the owner of, a, of some crypto punk that does not exist, the function will revert. It will not say the owner is Edward Zero. And uh, this will be important now when we check the approve function from Soulmate and cross check with the approve function from um, Open Zeppelin. So uh, 
what does the approve function do? Like we specify a spender, someone who's allowed to spend our NFT, and we specify the ID. So which NFT is he allowed to spend? Um, we're going to check here uh, the owner of the NFT, and then we're going to check for authentication, like is this uh, sender actually allowed to approve this NFT? And if yes, then, I mean, if no, then we would revert. And if yes, then we uh, set this spender as being approved to spend this uh, NFT. And we are done. This is kind of simple. If we check the approved function from Open Zeppelin, it does kind of the exact same. We get the owner off. Um, we have the owner. We do one more check that um, the guy we are approving the token to is not actually ourselves. So in Open Zeppelin, we cannot approve an NFT to ourselves. Uh, so it does not do this check. And so it's possible that I approve the token to myself. And it also does this um, authentication checks and then it approves the token. However, one big difference here um, is that Open Zeppelin uses the official owner of function, while Soulmate uses this direct X, array X, direct mapping access of underscore owner of, which means this function would revert if the token does not exist. You cannot, when you have an Open Zeppelin NFT, you cannot approve to someone NFT that does not exist. In Soulmate, it's no problem. In Soulmate, the owner here would be zero, but is approved for all. Wait, am I wrong now? Um, I'm a little bit confused now. However, I think you can approve here a token that's uh, not yet minted. And if so, then you would enable new use cases. Because if you would know, for example, that you receive an NFT in the future, you could approve it already to someone. But actually reading this line of code, now I'm a little bit confused if it's Sorry, let's go to the next point. Yeah, sorry, I will. No, no, uh, like, uh, let's go ahead. Um, I was just scratching my head. Ah, okay, sorry. Uh, uh, I, I will check this again. If yeah, like, what, do, what, is the, uh, what is the mapping is approved for? Like, what does it exactly do? Um, is this a, it's approved for owner. So uh, we check whether the token is approved. Wait, I think we should check the open Zeppelin because they have a lot of. Yeah, they do have comments at least. Yeah, exactly. They have it inside of the interface. Yeah, get it in. It's approved for returns of the operator, which is this guy, which is in this case at message.sender, is allowed to manage all of the assets of owner. And owner address is address zero. zero in this case. Yeah. And he will. So, yeah, basically, he, this method of sender would be allowed to uh, operate for any of the non minted ERC 721. Yeah, exactly. But the address zero, if this would be address zero, it would need to call this set approval for all functions to set the operator to true. And this is, of course, not possible for address zero. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's actually, um, OK, you can also not approve a token that does not exist yet in um, Soulmate. There, I was wrong. I'm sorry about that. Um, good point. Thank you, Raul, for uh, pointing that out again. Um, however, in the transfer from function, then let's continue to the transfer from function. Um, we have here again some unchecked code. Uh, the comments that uh, underflow of the sender's balance is impossible because we check for the ownership above, above which we do here. Um, here. And uh, that it cannot realistically overflow. This is again the same problem as in, ESC, as in the ESC20 example, because we can adjust the balance of mapping without the owner of. Uh, mapping so we can again break this invariant that we have a balance for someone which is not owned by anyone and um, we can again create here an underflow um, quite easily by accessing this uh, this mappings here directly instead of using the uh, kind of official mint and burn functions which in this case always if you uh, 
um, increase the balance off for someone, you also set him to the owner. If you would not, if you would only do one of these things uh, in your own functionality, then you could again trigger here an over and or underflow. Um, yeah, so this are, you see there are a lot of uh, food guns in, um, in Soulmate and you should be really careful to uh, when you use this. And uh, now we're going to check the safe transfer lib because it's also a really important uh, library like uh, how do you transfer ESC20s and ETH safe. And um, this will also be a little bit of an assembly lesson because if we check into it, There's um, there's really not so much we can do without understanding the assembly a little bit, because it's oh man, why is all of this comments not open? Because it is mostly assembly, all of this functionality here. It's kind of only assembly. So we're going to go a little bit into um, low level EVM and assembly, but it will not be too much and um, just be enough to understand this safe transfer from function. And these two functions are kind of the same. So um, first thing again, we're going to read uh, the documentation. We have safe ETH and ESC20 transfer library. Um, here's already something again, used with caution. Yeah, that's what we like. Um, some functions in this library knowingly create dirty bits at the destination of the free memory pointer. Um, we're going to get to that, what that means exactly, but in the end, it means something like uh, in un later on unallocated memory, we do not zero it out. If you normally leave memory, like in C, for example, you call free and it gets uh, zero out, um, or you can have it zero out. In this case, Soulmate explicitly leaves uh, dirty bits inside of the memory. Um, there's another one, another at dev comment. Note that none of the functions in this library check that the token has coded all. So all of these functions are something with a token, right? We want to call it ESC20 transfer. Uh, it does not check whether the token has coded all. That responsibility is delegated to the caller. And the caller is, in this case, us, because we are using this library. And um, if we... Uh, yeah, let's first check the problematic. Why? What does this mean? A token has no code, and uh, why is this problematic? So, um, of course, so, like we can give in any address, and an address can be an EOA or something like this. It does not need to be a contract which has code. Um, so, before using this soulmate self transfer lib, we need to check whether code dot uh, token the address dot code dot length is unequal to zero. This means that the contract actually has code inside, and um, why is this problematic? Why do we not do this anyway? Um, this is all. This is low-level call. This like we do here low-level assembly. So we do here low-level opcode call. And um, if we check into the documentation of this call opcode, in which which we call a new contract for which EVM dot codes is um, the way to go, we have here the opcode call. It um, executes the code at the given contract, so we can call a new contract. And it says here, note that an account with no code will return success at, as true. So if we call, if we use this call up code and call a contract, an address, which does not, where there is no code, this in, is effectively a no operation, a no op. And um, it says, yeah, everything went fine. Um, because we can, like we can say it's, it depends on your point of view, but it says everything is fine and it returns true. So in this case, um, we actually would not transfer any ESC20. We cannot, if we are a trader or something like this, we cannot assume that this is actually our true definition that we uh, successfully transferred this token. Um, the question again, why is this check missing? Well, it's gas optimization. If you have a system, if you, for example, are Uniswap and someone wants to create a pool, and uh, this is a totally new token, you never heard of this before, you never had it in your system before, um, of course, you should check whether it has code at all. But if you did this one time, and then let's assume that there's no self-destruct in the contract, it's enough to do this one time. You have to do it one time in the beginning, check whether the contract has code, and from then on, it just costs unnecessary gas. And... Um, that's what Soulmate is optimizing for. Soulmate is optimizing for the 99%, and this 1% is 
delegated to the caller. If we check this with Open Zeppelin, um, you probably can guess already what they are doing. Um, so here's their safe ERC20. They also have this safe transfer, safe transfer from, and all of this functions call this private internal call optional return function. And that function here has also some documentation. And we they say here, uh, they call some function that verifies that the target address contains contract code. So Open Zeppelin, if you use Open Zeppelin, you don't have to care about this. It, it does this check, but it also does this check on every transfer, even though it's only necessary the first time that you have this token inside of your system, if you're careful about this. Um, so yeah, that's again here a big difference. And you need to read all the documentation to um, understand this. And um, <clears throat> now a little bit into the assembly stuff. So we start here with the safe transfer ease. We want to transfer from some token, and we want to transfer to some address some amount of ease. Um, if we start here an assembly block, and we want to access variables uh, that are outside, or we want to later use variables from this block, then we need to declare them outside of the uh, of this assembly block. Uh, it's just a matter of fact. So uh, we later do here this call. We check. We want to save whether the call succeeded. We require that it succeeded. So we need to declare that variable outside. And now, yeah, all all we do is kind of we just call some contract to. We give the amount of ETH. And um, does not look too complicated. So let's check again into the documentation for the call. Um, we see here it has some kind of arguments, um, gas, the amount of gas that this call is allowed to ex to use, some address that this con that this call is going to execute, um, a value in like the ETH that we're going to send it, denominated in Y, um, and arguments and return values. We're going to come to that later, but in this case, we don't have any arguments. We just want to send ETH to this two person. The gas opcode returns all the amount of gas that we still have left in our operation. So um, we allow this person that or this address that we sent the uh, ETH to to spend all of our gas. That's totally fine. And um, a call itself returns zero, which is false, um, which is the Boolean representation for false if the call reverted and one if not, so if everything went fine. So success is later on either zero or one. And then we put it into the require statement. It reads it as a Boolean. Boolean zero means um, we have a revert. So uh, we do not uh, succeed. We say the ease transfer failed. And if it's one, we went through the check succeeded and we are done. We sent some ease to this person. And now to a little bit more interesting, code the safe transfer from function. So um, we want to send some token from uh, our wallet, from some wallet to some other, other wallet and some specific amount. We again, at some point do here this call and we want to save whether it succeeded and want to check for it. So we need to declare this variable here. And otherwise it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lines of assembly code. And yeah, we are going to get through this now. First, um, a little bit of uh, hex conversion, um, just because these are magic numbers that later show up here and so that you know already what this is. 0x20 in hexadecimal is 32 in decimal. 32 means in this case 32 bytes. This means 256 bit. And because we are on the EVM and we are uh, EVM is a word-based machine, one word is 32 bytes. So this is one word. 0x40 is 2 times 0x20. This means 2 times 32, this is 64. So we have 64 bytes. This means in this case, two words. So we have, for example, uh, 0x40, this could be fit uh, two uints or two addresses or whatever, like two times 32 bytes. And um, now we have here also this magic number 0x40. And 0x40 is the most important number in assembly because it's um, get a pointer to some free memory. It's a free memory pointer location. So what does the what does free memory pointer mean? Means mean in this case, um, the free memory pointer is 
located at 0x40. Just have to remember this. And it returns um, a pointer to the next free memory, to the next kind of unallocated memory. If you think about C with this malloc, it's kind of similar to the unallocated memory. Um, and um, one thing that's important to uh, remember is that starting from this free memory pointer, you're now kind of allowed to write from there into the memory, starting from there. But you should not expect that there everything there is zero. You, there can be some dirty bits, also solidity that's the dirty bits. So don't assume if you now load, load from this free memory pointer something that it's only zeros because it's uninitialized memory. That's not the case in uh, solidity in the EVM. And then maybe a, a question like, what are the first two uh, words before 0x40? So from 0x0 to 0x40, 0x40 is this free memory pointer. What's the two times 32 bytes before that? Um, that's called the scratch space. This is, um, I think initially it was uh, thought of for a hashing calculation that you have something to save uh, stuff in. Nowadays, it's, or at least that's how I got to learn it, it's just short-term storage. Like you can just put in something there, you have two words where you can save stuff. Um, however, as soon as you leave this assembly block and go, for example, do one require statement here and here want to go again into some assembly block, you should not assume that the scratch space holds the data because Solidity also just writes their stuff inside and does not delete it. And um, it's the scratch space. It's, uh, it's there for everyone. Uh, so do not depend on it. And yeah, OK, now we get the free memory pointer. We know where we are allowed to write stuff. And um, what do we even need to write into the memory? Well, when we do this call, we call this token. We need to tell the contract this three arguments, right? So this, this three arguments, this is the stuff we now need to write into the contract. We need to tell the ERC20 token when we call its transfer from function, from whom do we want to transfer and to whom and the amount. Um, so we do an M store. M store stands for memory store. So we write uh, 32 bytes, one word, starting from the free memory pointer into the memory. And Soulmate here says, write the ABI encoded call data into memory, beginning with the function selector. Um, then first question, though, what is this kind of? This is, again, some long magic string. It says a little bit of function selector. This is maybe this stuff, maybe not. So um, we should find this out. And for this, I think uh, the best thing, how I always do it, if I get this kind of long things here and try to find out how many bytes that is, is um, if you are on Unix system, you get this command line utility BC for word counts. Uh, you can count with that words, characters, bytes, and everything. So um, we're going to. Wait. So we're going to now count the amount of bytes that um, this string, this long number here, contains, and it says sixty-five, which is not totally correct because if we run echo command, we see it also prints a new line. So a new line is one byte, so we subtract one byte. We have 64 bytes. This means if we count all the characters here, one, two, three, four, five, we will at the end land at 64. Um, 64 in hexadecimal, 64 hexadecimal numbers. Um, if we remember from some hacking time ago that one byte always has to be two numbers, right? We have hexadecimal, two numbers is one byte, so we can so we can divide this 65, we have 32. So yeah, this is actually 32 bytes. Uh, this is one word. We now save 32 bytes into the memory. And um, now we need to check what is this function selector. It's probably this kind of magic numbers here. Um, when we call now into some contract, um, it does not, the contract needs to know which, con which function do you want to call, right? Do you want to call the transfer function, the transfer form function? Maybe do you want to get into the fallback, whatever? Um, this is done per definition by, with the function selector. The function selector is defined as uh, the first four bytes of the catcher cache of the function signature. So in this case, the function signature that we want to call is transfer form address address uint because that's the ERC20 function that we want to call. 
Um, then we take make the hash, we hash it, and then we take the first four bytes out of this. And um, if we count this thing here, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight divided by two again is four. So this thing here seems to be four bytes. Everything is correct. But of course, we don't want to trust this code, um, especially not with so many magic numbers. We always want to check it ourselves. So um, we use the cast tool, which is also compound read. We um, want to get some uh, signature. And the signature that we want to have is the transfer from address from address to amount. And if we run this command, we get something like two, three, dum, 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 dd. Um, if we check this here, yeah, two, three, dd seems good. Seems like this is the real uh, function selector for the transfer from function. And um, yeah, now we can, okay, this is, this we do soon. And yeah, now we have our first four uh, bytes of function selector. And now we can write our from argument into the memory. Um, where do we need to write it to? We have here our 32 bytes. And um, this is, um, this part here is where the free memory pointer points to, right? Because we just started to write here. So we need to increase our free memory pointer by four bytes, which is then here directly after the function selector. And um, then we store there the from variable. The from variable is one word, 32 bytes. So we um, are kind of here then with, uh, so we have 32 bytes, which means uh, we write this kind of amount and then four bytes more. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we kind of would, all of this here is now the from argument. And now we want to write the two argument, which means we need to move this pointer again about 32 bytes to here, and then write the um, two argument, which means we add the free memory pointer, add to it 60, 36, four plus 32, we write the two argument, now we are somewhere here. And now we need to write the amount, which is the unsigned integer, which means again, uh, 32 more. So we have 32 plus 32 plus four, which is 68. And somewhere here where the monitor ends, we write the uint amount that we want to um, send. And now, cool, we have all the data written to memory. Um, and we yeah, are nearly Pascal, done. Pascal? Yeah. Uh, I think um, there's a question. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think address is supposed to take 20 bytes, right? Not 32. That's totally correct. That's the important disclaimer that's coming in one minute. Oh, okay. You're totally okay. correct, yeah. Um, and also I put something in the chat. So, I mean, I think you don't think see it. Uh, oh, shit, no, I... Uh, yeah, I, I just simply wrote that, uh, like, it is, again, dan dangerous because of probable sig signature collisions. Uh, transfer from two address. Uh, it can have the same signature for first four bytes of signature as some other uh, cat hash of uh, some other function. Yeah, that's true. You mean the function collision problem? That yeah, right. Exactly. Right, right. Um, yeah, that's totally true. Um, but I think you cannot other security guarantees to do it from the caller side. I think you always have to just take care from if you are the contract who has this maybe function collision. Right. Um, but yeah, this definitely exists. And to this uh, to this problem with uh, 20 bytes of the address, we come now in a second. Um, one question I just want to clarify before is how many bytes did we now wrote into memory? Um, because that's important in a second. So we have four bytes of the function selector, 32 bytes of address, 32 bytes of address, 32 bytes of the amount. You in, so in the end, we wrote 100 bytes of data into the memory. And now we come to the important disclaimer of that address is actually only 20 bytes. Um, <clears throat> How does it look in memory then? So let's assume we have this beef, 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 beef address. Um, then it looks hopefully like this in memory. We have 32 bytes. The address itself is only 20 bytes. And uh, the highest order bits, so the bits to the left, are all zeros. That's how it should be kind of if we uh, develop. And uh, Solidity takes care of that if we get 32 bytes from someone and we want to read it as an address that it just reads the uh, this first 20 bytes and not the left part. However, 
you should not count on that this stuff here is actually zero because um, I'm not sure whether Solidity does this always, but you, if you have assembly code, if you use assembly code, you definitely don't have to clean this stuff. And you can have here uh, some other stuff saved. Um, yeah. And to the question, why do we have to anyway send 32 bytes for an address? Because the EVM is word aligned. We always have one word and that is always 32 bytes. Even a Boolean is 32 bytes, even if it's just zero or one, and then the rest is just zeros. Um, that's just the way we have to go with it. Um, but very good point, yeah. And um, now we do, now we have here, now, now we wanna do our call. We have everything saved in memory. And um, this is something quite interesting where also this comment helped me a lot. Um, counterintuitively, this statement here is executed before this statement, as it seems. Um, I'm also not really sure about why, but um, otherwise the return data size that we're coming to in a second will be zero. Um, so, okay, let's first go to this statement and then to this statement and see what this is all about. So um, we do our call, we again give, we do our call, we again give all the gas that we have left for the, um, sorry, I just see now that uh, Felix is so near the monitor, so yeah. Um, so we have a call, and we give, uh, for the execution, we give the contract as much gas as we have left. Um, which contract are we calling? This token contract. And um, this zero stands for the amount of ETH that we want to send. In this case, we don't want to send any ETH. And now we have this for um, arguments. And if we check again in the evm.codes um, website, we see these arguments are the the first two here are for the arguments and the second two are for the return values that we receive back from the um, from the call. And um, this first thing here is the argument offset. So where in memory do our arguments that we want to give to this uh, function, uh, where do they start? And we wrote the first time we started to write into the at position free memory pointer. So the argument offset where our arguments start are at the free memory pointer. Then um, the contract we're calling knows, okay, we have to start somewhere, but how long do we need to read? What, if, what of all the stuff is our um, arguments? And that's why we calculated it here, where we wrote 100 bytes uh, in the end into the memory. So uh, the contract now knows, okay, I start to read at this position in memory and I read for 100 bytes, and this is my arguments. And then it returns some stuff. And we know the transfer from function, it returns a Boolean. Um, and where do we want to save this Boolean? A Boolean is 32 bytes. So where do we want to save it? We say we want to save it in our memory at position zero. If we remember back position zero is uh, the scratch, pass, scratch space where we can always write stuff to, but where we are, should never assume that it stays there for a second, second as soon as we are out of an assembly block. Um, but that's fine. We're going to write now. We're going to write this uh, bytes, uh, this boolean that we get back just into the scratch space at position zero. And then we come to this monster thing here. Ah, yeah. And one more thing, of course, the call uh, returns zero if the execution reverted or one if everything went fine. And in the end, we have here an end concatenation with this statement and the call. So this end, of course, will fail as soon as one of these two is zero. So if this call here reverts, then this will be false and the success will be false and we definitely revert here. And if this call here uh, works fine, no, no uh, reverting, then it just depends on this statement. And what the fuck does this statement do? Uh, I hope this breaks it down a little bit. So um, let's start here with the innermost uh, statements, we have an M load, so memory load, we load from the memory at position zero. Uh, what's at position zero? This thing here, the return value from the call. That is our scratch pad. So we load the, load the 32 bytes that we received back from this call. Now, 
onto our stack and check whether if it's equal to one. Um, what does this mean? Well, this 32 bytes, we expect it to be a Boolean because that's what the transfer function is returning. And if it's equal to one, then it means that uh, the Boolean is set to true, yeah? The, the, uh, the call is, um, is happening first, like, although it's on the second position? Yeah, that's kind of the thing I'm also a little bit, um, like here is a comment which says counterintuitively, this call must be positioned second to the OR call uh, in the surrounding end call or else return data size, but we are going to check into a second, will be zero during the computation. So um, yeah, it seems that this call is executed first and then this, but don't take my word for it now too much, but it wouldn't work otherwise because we cannot, like if we would load something from zero, uh, this, Boolean would not be there already, right? Okay. So um, I would very much assume now that this call is executed first and then this is um, executed also due to this comment here. Um, and yeah, now we load this um, Boolean that we receive back into onto our stack and we check if it's equal to zero. If it's equal to zero, zero is the solidity representation for true for Boolean. So this statement here is true. If we uh, receive true back from the function. If it's zero, then this would be false. This would be false. And then only this could still happen, but we assume it's true. And now we check if the return data size, that's the amount of data that we received back um, from the function. We only saved 32 bytes from what we received back, but it could have returned more back. And we check if this return data that we received back is more than 31 bytes. Why um, more than 31 bytes? A Boolean is 32 bytes. So this would be true if it returns a Boolean, but maybe it returns a Boolean and some more data, which would be not against the ESC20 standard because the ESC20 standard just says return a Boolean. It does not like on the EVM low level in the end says you are not allowed to return more data than that. So if we, if it returns one, yeah. But it's checking greater than, right? So uh, Boolean plus something would return true. Um, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. It returns, yeah, it checks here if we are greater than uh, 32. So this would so, be with. Yeah, if, if we return two Booleans, then, then again, it will be true, not uh, false. If, again, if we return a Boolean, then it will be true, right? No, I'm saying that uh, it's checking that the return data size should be greater than 31, right? So yeah. ideally it should return only one Boolean. So 32 is greater than 31, that is fine. But even if I return two Booleans, then the return data size would, would be 64. And still this check would pass. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, so as long as we get data back that we can interpret as a Boolean because it's okay. 32 bytes, we are happy because then we interpret it as a Boolean and this way we interpret it as a uh, per standard and we are happy. Um, yeah. And then we check if both of this is true. And um, yeah, if both of this is true, then we, are, we have here an or, concat or concatenation. So we don't care about this one anymore if this is true already. However, this checks here, if one of this is false, for example, we didn't receive, um, we didn't receive um, enough back, then we check whether the return data say, size is zero. And if it's zero, then we are also happy. So if we didn't re receive any data back and all of this together in the end then says, uh, this statement is true. If no return data was returned back or if the return data that we received back can be interpreted as Solidity's Boolean true representation. And um, this is then concatenated with an AND to, with a call. So this whole assembly statement says in the end uh, is true if the call does not revert and it returns no data or the return data is a Boolean true representation. And if that is the case, then this require statement will succeed and we successfully send um, yeah, the ESC20 tokens to some, uh, to some other address. And now just 
we'll cross check again to the safe ESC20 from Open Zeppelin. Um, we have here something similar. So uh, we do here our function call. Here we, uh, in the end, call the token and do this transfer. And we also check here if the return data dot length is zero, which we do in this in the soulmate part um, here. If it's zero, then we are happy. Then uh, we pass. If it's not zero, then we require that we uh, can pass the return data into a Boolean. This is the part kind of this part here. And that this Boolean is true. This is this part here. So um, I would now um, say that uh, from reading the code that um, the both safe, uh, safe transfer from functionality from open Zeppelin and soulmate are functionally equivalent, except of this verifier that the target address contains code, which um, open Zeppelin does via the address contract here, in which we just check is the contract an address, uh, is the address a contract, and open Zeppelin says yes, it's a contract as long as it has code. And this check, this function call is executed before every safe transfer function, um, which costs gas, which soulmate does not do. You need to do it yourself in this case. And um, from there, I'm also done with showing you, giving you a small introduction to the soulmate contracts. What you should definitely keep in mind is kind of what's written into the readme. They are not designed with user safety in mind. Invariants that you normally have that open Zeppelin make sure you cannot break are here implicitly uh, stated and Soulmate expects you to hold them, but you can break them. And it's really, really easy to shoot yourself in the foot. Also, um, code when code is designed to be self-documenting and we're talking about assembly code, um, we're not talking about, we're talking about an expert system. Yeah. And take this and have this in mind when you audit code where there's solidity code involved. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. That was very cool. Any questions, or at least the ones that we can still cover? There's probably many questions still. So in the in the last example with the safe transfer, one of the optimizations was also that they basically uh, created their own like specific function call, uh, low level call, right? Like if if we look in the um, in the Open Zeppelin version, they they uh, they basically do the uh, yeah the the function call. Which technically is a high level, still a high level call that that you do, where you probably do some abstract abstraction that you can use it with every function, and they basically build it from scratch with the uh, uh, with the M store in in the Soulmate, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Soulmate builds everything from scratch. Um... I'm checking here. I think yeah, in Open Zeppelin, it does not see that they use the call opcode directly. They seem to use target.call. Um, here, here they do some. Here they send some value. Um, I'm also not low level enough to know exactly what kind of uh, checks Solidity does here before, um, like before it executes exactly this code. So if Open Zeppelin has some Solidity build-in checks uh, automatically with that. Um, but I would guess, though, that there are some checks that uh, doing it by assembly are, uh, yeah, not done, which otherwise are always done by Solidity directly. There's only, like, only one thing that I'd like to add here, that uh, whenever you do any low-level call, delegate call, function call, whatever, uh, even if the target address where you're calling the uh, function, if it does not exist, it will return as true. Uh, but only in the case of uh, in instantiating a new uh, target address and then calling it, suppose there is a contract A and you do capital A, small a, as in inst instantiating the new uh, 
contact address and then calling a dot function then it will check whether the function i mean uh, contract exists or not and it will revert if the contract does not exist so uh, that is probably what open zeppelin is doing uh, beneath the hood when they are doing function calls okay that's really yeah. interesting to know yeah that that's probably one of the yeah. yeah i guess i don't know about this but yeah Cool. And also, is this true that uh, if you put multiple conditions in a require statement, it takes more gas than using uh, separate require statements? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, sounds interesting. So you mean if yeah. you have here something like success and I don't yeah. know, not fail, yeah. that it uses this more will... than just doing this? Yes, I mean, uh, when we had the code in audit some time back, uh, this was one of the most commonly reported gas optimization. So uh, I'm not sure if this is focused on gas optimization, then they should have probably gone with more required statements rather than clubbing the conditions together. And also, I did see some mm -hmm. post increments compared to pre increments. So that again is a very small nitty gritty detail. Yeah, this is yeah, this is kind of the famous one in the last time, right? And, uh, <laughs> e plus yeah, plus, everyone, you better use yeah, right. this one. Oh, yeah, plus plus, I, yeah. So I well, saw that in balances plus plus uh, and minus minus of balances. Uh, they're not doing pre increment; they're doing post increments. So probably. Uh, yeah, I, I think um, with a lot of these things, we have to be careful from now on with the new um, via, via, via yeah. IR yeah. thing, because I... definitely this um, uh, there's also this thing, right, that you um, that this array dot length. Um, you should normally cache it outside where it's something like yes. this. Right. Um, and I think I did not check it. So here. I did not check it, but I think this is not valid anymore, starting from the Maya minus minus via IR pipeline. And um, yeah, I heard that a lot of stuff like this pipeline is supposed to be a lot better. It has this new intermediate uses Yule optimizations a lot more. So um, yeah. I, like I heard this. In, yeah. Yeah. I heard this does away with that stack to deep error. Like with YI, you don't have stack to deep error. I just heard it once. Yeah, that I heard too. No stack overflows anymore. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's definitely. I think um, probably there can be a lot of gas optimizations now done in uh, uh, Open Zeppelin and Solmet and other libraries that were before that valid and now the pipeline, the compiler optimizes it itself already and we can go back to a little bit more cleaner code again. Um, <laughs> yeah. Would be a nice new topic for the new presentation via, via IR. Mm. Very true. Awesome. Okay. Thank you very much for the super great introduction to Soulmate. Um, that, was, that was super valuable. And yeah, there will be more in the future, whether it's about YIR pipelines or other stuff. So, all right, until next time.